and touch is on our uh, and touch is on the sermon today a little bit because a lot of what we're looking at today is the Lord's Prayer and also the Tabernacle side by side and Temple and uh, the Tabernacle, the Temple, and the Lord's Prayer is all a big focus of it is the cross. So again, God using us supernaturally, God is even realizing it. Showing us that he has providence, sovereignty, and everything we do, especially when we come and we yield our lives to him. When we just say that with our hearts, we really mean it. God, we yield our lives to you and submit our lives to you. God will use that. He will use that, even without us knowing it sometimes. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. So it serves today. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I always remember that one uh, ancient priest back in 300 or so. I just remember his name. He uh, every he's a monk actually. Every every morning they come up and they would, they do their whole thing and say their statements. And then they leave and come back three hours later to do it again, right? Uh, but one service was just he said, "I have one word for you," and he pointed to the cross and he got down and that was it. So <laughs> I will never forget that. So maybe one day I'll. But what if I did that? One? What would you guys do? <laughs> just sit here and think about it and contemplate like a monastery, you know, like in the monastery and just really like think about it and pray. Yeah. That was the point. All right. So our sermon series, we're continuing. The sermon series is entitled Prayer. And today it's going to be looking at the Our Father, the Our Father Prayer, and also the Tabernacle. The sermon scripture verse today is Matthew 6, 9 through 15. Which will be for a few weeks now. We're going to do the Our Father. We're going to look at uh, in detail for probably about seven or eight weeks. And then we're going to go into other scripture verses on prayer. Matthew 6, 9 through 15. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And the Lord added his blessing to his word. So why are we looking at prayer so extensively. And the reason why is because we have some big things, I believe, coming up in our culture, coming up in the world. As we said a few weeks ago, it doesn't matter who wins the election, there's going to be some level of backlash. Some people are saying there's going to be really fantastic and amazing, in the negative sense, things that take place in our country that will alter it for a little bit or begin the altering of it forever, uh, or for a long period of time at least. Uh, and those things in particular may not be good for the church at all, in the sense of how we enjoy a lack of persecution in our country. So persecution may rise, especially socially speaking, in the years, in the months possibly, to come, depending on what happens with a lot of different things, uh, which the least of which is not, uh, is not the election. All kinds of different things may take place, and this is what Jesus has prophesied about. But the place where you should come to for refuge, the place where you come to for life and support in our lives the center, the first thing you should do is pray. Is prayer. Is come to God in prayer. That is the center of our spiritual lives. And it is, as Jesus is the center of our lives, is the center of everything that comes out of our lives. Is prayer. And everything in between it is prayer. What is the will of God for us? That we pray for a little bit. That we pray for a few minutes a day. That we pray when for all seasons. 
that we pray just when things are getting tough and we're like, we're in the foxhole now. We can start praying now. When the persecution comes, that's when you pray. In the meantime, God knows you're there. It's okay. No, that's not what the will of God for us is. The will of God expressly is to pray continually. Pray and be in this mindset of prayer, recognizing that you are a living temple. And God himself, the creator of the world, is dwelling in each of us and uniting us all as one body, near and far, that transcends our understanding, just as, as we pick the hymns randomly, transcends, transcends our understanding in that way. We pick the hymns that connects with our sermons, not even knowing it, his providence, his providence and sovereignty transcends our understanding. In the same way, God is in each of us who will truly believe and who are walking with Jesus together with him. There's that connection that happens there that empowers us. But the entire thing is fueled and based on continual prayer and walking with that mindset. Pray continually. Rejoice always. Rejoice always, and in all things, give thanks. That's the will of God for us. So prayer. Prayer. Two things I want to focus on today. The place of prayer and prayer. Specifically, the format that God has given to us to pray. There's also different things he's said about prayer, which we'll look at after this. But there's the format of prayer, the only format in the entire Bible for praying, our Father. And then also, the place of prayer. Back in the days, there was this tabernacle, back in the ancient, ancient days, the time of Moses, there was a tabernacle. The tabernacle was the place that you would come to to meet with God. You would come to talk to God there. Now, we all pray, everyone's always prayed, just start to pray throughout all history. But if you wanted to meet with God, there was this understanding back in the days that you would meet with God in his temple. You talk to God here, but you can meet with him there. There's a difference. Actually, it's a very strong Eastern thing today still, too. The whole entire East, from the end of the West, all the way to the East, that's still a very big part of their life. From the West over, not so much. But from the East, right, the places of prayer are very, very significant. Then as time went on, there was this temple that was built. And it was the same kind of concept. And then there was this something that took place and called the diaspora, the, the Jewish people, or the Hebrew people. Uh, Israel, Judah, they went through this period called the diaspora, the first diaspora. And they were taken to Babylon, and they were taken to Persia. And while they were there, before they got there, they actually thought that there was this force field that would cover the temple and cover Jerusalem and I mean, Enemies of God came, kind of like what happened with the Egyptians, which is where they get this from. Where the, when they attacked Moses and the people of God, there was, a, in a sense, a force field that kind of came up and prevented them from attacking. So they thought that's what would happen. That's what we had thought. That that's what would happen back in those days. They would be protected. And then when everything happened, they were like, what happened? What is going on? They were shocked. Like, what happened? And so they started this thing called a synagogue. This time period of the diaspora. And what it was was dedicated to focusing on the covenant, to know specifically what it says so they don't get it wrong again and not be in this situation again. So the ancient synagogue system, sorry, that was carried over into when they came back. The synagogue system was primarily focused on that. Focused on the idea of learning the covenant and learning what the Word of God says. And it, community formed around that. It was the center of the communities of each community in the Jewish culture as they came back, and also around the world, even in Persia and Babylon. Was, the, the, uh, the Hebrews who stayed, they, they, they did that. We see lots of traces of you know, evidence of that today. In both Ethiopia, there's those places. There's, but it all started in the synagogue, keeping the synagogue system. And as time went on, there was something called the house church. House church wasn't necessarily dedicated to focusing on the covenant. It was really dedicated on meeting with God. It was back to meeting with God as it was in the temple. Meeting with God through his people, working the Holy Spirit, 
working through those people so that they can meet with God and touch the world around them. And then this time went on, it was a synagogue system that came into the church as well. The idea of knowing the covenant and learning and growing, and it was this melding that happened, which became the church in the first hundred years. And then as time went on, there was this idea of the temple becoming part of these church buildings, which is why we use stained glass, which is why we have these really ornate church buildings and things like that, because go back to ancient, ancient, ancient Israel, and it was a place of heaven on earth. It's a place of heaven on earth where you would meet with God. So we wanted to make our buildings to look like heaven, a piece of heaven. When you walked into a church, it was as if you were walking, as it was in the tabernacle, as it was in the temple, you were walking into a place that is like heaven, a heavenly portal in a sense. You would come and you would be in a place of heaven as you would meet with the church in the presence of God. There was people in his presence being there. But Jesus, with all of that, which is all wonderful, Jesus said, once he died, he rose from the dead. He said that you are now that temple. You are that place of prayer. You are that prince, that presence that people would come to. Jesus says the temple is a place that is supposed to be a house of prayer to all nations. You now, individually and corporately, are the house of you are the house of prayer, where the nations are supposed to come to, to reconcile with God. Some of us wonder when we're talking with our loved ones. I'm going to show you four verses that show this emphatically in the New Testament. Some of our loved, we come to our loved ones and we're like, why, you know, what can we do to draw our loved ones to ourselves? What can we do to bring them closer to us and closer to God? I don't have any in an extreme sense, healing powers that God has given me. <laughs> I don't have any powers of miracles. I don't have a, a great knowledge in the Word of God, and if I say a prayer with them, it'll probably say, you know, whatever, you know. I'll probably say, take me out to the ball game, and our Father, and fix it all together in one, or something, something like that. There are people who really, like, I have nothing to offer. But the one thing you can offer and the one thing that you are is a place of prayer. You can offer to sing with them or pray with them, sit with them and pray with them, something. Because God has created you as he saved you to be that temple, to be that priest, part of that priesthood. It's called the priesthood of believers, Martin Luther says. It's a really big deal. You are, when you are saved, you are saved into the house of priests underneath Jesus. You are priestesses and priests in Jesus. And you are called in the service of a priest. You are called in the service of a priest. You are called to be the house the priest would serve in for all people. So one thing you can do is draw them to prayer. How many people know that nowadays that really most people, Christian, non-Christian, are okay with you praying for them? Most people, even if they don't even want to listen to they're okay with praying. That wasn't the case back in the days. It is now. People are open to pray. It's one of the first things we should always remember when we're talking with people is to remember that I have a house of prayer. And when people pray with me, they are going to experience God in some way. And I am going to fervently pray for them so their eyes will be open. The thing that they might need in their life will be changed. And then they would come to start to walk closer and be drawn closer by the grace of God to this place. They might not listen to your words, your apologetics, which is, I, I actually am a big fan of apologetics, huge fan of apologetics. But they might not listen to any of that. But the one thing they may listen to is the feeling and the presence and the touch of God through your prayers. Right? Through your prayers. And I want to read you the scripture verse that show you guys Show us all that you are considered the temple, individually and corporately. You are, have this wonderful privilege to be the place of reconciliation for mankind. And all of creation, by the way, not just mankind, it's all of creation for God. You are the place of reconciliation. You are the house of 
1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17 says this, Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you, just as in the temple? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. There's actually been historians that did a, a view of this, of the, the people who have destroyed the temple of God back in the days, especially the Caesars. What happened to them? That's exactly what happened to them. Those Caesars, those powerful men, right, who destroyed God's temple, they got brought down in the most horrific ways. God destroyed them. That's true. But the emphasis here is not that that. Just that Paul wanted to make that very clear to everybody. The emphasis here is that you are that holy unto God when you come to Christ. You are a holy temple. It's an amazing, wonderful thing. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says this, Or you do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. And that Christ was the blood of Christ. So glorify God in your body. Glorify, that's a command. Glorify God in your body. Now the temple here, the, word, the words here for temple, the first one emphasizes a little temple. But you are this a, a microcosm, a smaller picture of the whole temple. In with Christ being the head as we look at. The other one focuses on this thought that we are all spalas, all pieces of a greater, huge temple that is the church. Okay? Colossians 1, 18-20, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Speaking about Jesus. For in him all the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell. That means in him, whom you are a part of, the entire Trinity dwells in him, and he is a complete expression of the Trinity. So that complete expression, in a way, as him being the head, but you are connected to it, dwells in you too. We might not realize that. You may not realize how significant your salvation is, but let me tell you, it is extremely significant. It is probably, bar none, the most significant thing on earth outside of God himself. Do you guys ever realize that? How many of you realize that? Not many. That's what you are. That's what God has saved you to. For in him all the foes of God are just pleased to dwell, in this verse 20, and through him, listen here, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And that's why it's so significant. Because you are that temple. The temple leads to the sacrifice, leads to all these things that represents the person and ministry of Jesus Christ to come. It's a foreshadow, just like all the feasts are foreshadows of Jesus to come. And you are that temple now. Where the places of sacrifice, and the sacrifice of Christ is explained and shown and is conveyed, and the blood of Jesus is conveyed to everything, not just to, to read up the to one more time, to all creation. All creation. Reconcile all things to himself. All things. Everything. Amazing. God, through you, and through just being that house of prayer, first and foremost, but then being everything else the temple was, in a spiritual sense, is literally reconciling Everything And God one day will reconcile everything to himself. And then the Bible says, unto the Father then. Everything. Amazing. Now, the Bible also talks about you being the temple and the place of prayer as a body as well. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. 
For just as the body is one and has many members, it's all of you, all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit you were all baptized into one body, Jew or Greek, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many members. So we're all, get this now, we're not just these stones. The body of Christ is a, a synchronized, sophisticated system, spiritual system, where each of us play a part as a little temple, but all work together as a body, as the incarnate body of Christ to touch the world. Each of us has a part to play in system and focus in its systems. It's an amazing, sophisticated, wonderful thing. That we are. Have any of you recognized the significance, the, 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 the reverence that comes with that, with who you are as a person who walks with Christ? It's definitely not just something we come to you on Sunday to socialize. It literally has to do with changing the world and everything in it through the blood of Christ. And it seems like, oh, it's so simple. No, no, there's a lot to that. Now, when you say the Our Father, I want to show you guys something really, really interesting. <clears throat> I'm just going to show you the outline today, and then we're going to go through this outline step by step. And I believe it will change, I hope actually, I'm praying it's going to change your prayer life forever. First and foremost, recognizing, as we said last week, how to pray. The mindset, the posture to be in. Second thing, as we're talking about today, is to remember you are a house of prayer. And as a house of prayer, you have a spiritual service as a priest or priestess in the house and the body of Christ. As Martin Luther said, as we believe, the priesthood of believers. Now, the tabernacle, as the feasts are, is a blueprint of the person and ministry of Jesus Christ, past, present, and future. It's a blueprint of that. So, uh, and it says, uh, God says to Moses that you make sure that you make this tabernacle according to everything that is in heaven, that you have seen. Hebrews 8, 5 says, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy, a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned, this is by God he was warned, when he was about to build the tabernacle. See, this is the quote, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. It's on Mount Sinai. And then Jesus says in John, John 2, they say to him, uh, this wonderful temple, and he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And they say, how can you destroy this temple that was made in 40 and 4 years, or something like that? And he says, uh, it says later on, he was not talking about the temple, but the temple of his body, which is a picture, though, of Jesus. His ministry and his purpose. So look at the blueprint of the tabernacle. Look what the priests did at each of those things. They would come in and they would serve God spiritually through this physical act of worship that they were doing and serving God. They would be in the presence of God. Now when we look at the Our Father format as a blueprint as well, you actually see that each of those spiritual things that he touches on in the Our Father prayer actually parallels the tabernacle, the place of and it's really interesting when you think of it that way, that the, our Father is a spiritual act of worship. These are those things to follow God's will, forgiveness. So I'm going to show you guys how it parallels. You're going to see it's, it's actually very, very clear. Now, this is not like a, a, a really like, a, you know, I haven't even heard this from anybody. I pretty much did this in prayer, I believe. But when you look at the Our Father and look at the tabernacle and recognize that you are the house of prayer, called to do spiritual worship. And look at this format and how it goes from one thing to the next that is, is literally right on target the whole way with walking through the tabernacle and doing the service in that tabernacle. That was done physically back then, but it was a spiritual representation of something. It was spiritual for back then too. You see that as you pray the Our Father, you're actually functioning as a priest in working in your spirit, this physical, spiritual temple that we are. You're working out Jesus as a spiritual temple, physical body, 
It's a place of reconciliation for the world. So this Our Father prayer gives you a bigger view of what it actually is. So it first starts off with saying, Our Father. So I'm going to show you the parallel now between the two, right? Is everyone with me? Does everyone walk with me? You guys got it? Two blueprints kind of parallel with each other? It's really, really fascinating. Okay, just make sure. I was actually really worried about that. All right. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if it makes, this doesn't make any sense. Okay. So. <clears throat> And the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to look at this prayer a lot differently. I think you are going to see it a lot differently. Recognizing, first and foremost, that you're the temple of God, and what the temple represents. And then also this prayer is a format, the only format in the Bible that God has called us to follow. Okay? So our Father who art in heaven, when you would walk upon the road that would lead to the tabernacle back in the days, or to the temple, what you would see is this amazing thing. You see this, especially the temple. But the tabernacle, you come upon, you see this beautiful sheets uh, that would, uh, or, or linen cloths that would hang down, silver tops, little brass bottoms that were all shiny, this beautiful screen. And it was right in front of it. It was four different embroidered colors of purple and blue and white and red. And all of them represent something, which we'll get into at a different time. But it all represents the kingdom of God. It's all intertwined together. What you would look like is somewhat like a beautiful display of color as you come up to that gate, as you come up to that beautiful tent. And as the screen opened, you would see all these different particular things. You see the sacrifice, and you see this golden packed tent in the background that was black. And then if you would go into it, you'd see these water cherubim and this beautiful light and gold everywhere. And it's this amazing, amazing tent system. When you go to the temple back in the days, it was, they said it was like going to see a snow-capped mountain on a mountain ride because the temple mount was made of white limestone, which is in the Middle East, it's very bright white limestone. And there was gold on it, and it was beautiful, it was gorgeous. It probably would have been the top ancient wonder of the world today. It was, it was like a Taj Mahal, but even like on steroids. It was amazing. And Titus, well, the Taj Mahal is really great, but this, this supposedly was an architectural wonder of the world. Titus, when he came home to conquer Jerusalem, he actually stopped for a second, talked to his Roman generals and, and different people, and I think he even talked to his dad, Vespasian, not 100% sure on that, who was the emperor at the time. And he said, should we actually destroy this part? Should we just leave this part alone? Because it's so beautiful. And they decided to destroy it anyway. But... They actually did stop and said, maybe we shouldn't touch this. But all to say, the Temple of Solomon, the temple that Herod made, which was much bigger, tabernacle, all this, this beautiful, amazing system that was created and designed by God. It just makes you say, wow. Now, this whole thing is designed, as we know, the person in the Trinity who deals with design and deals with the whole thing is the Father. And what everything is being reconciled to is the Father. So the first thing we recognize is that this whole thing is designed and empowered by the Father. The Son that speaks with the design was given to him into existence, and the Holy Spirit then fills and completes. Right? So we say, Our Father. Because when we talked about the Father, we're looking at all this, and we're saying, Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How wonderful is this? All this design, all of this amazement, creation that we see in everything, we say, hallowed be your name, because of how powerful God is, so we reverend him, but also because of what he's designed, how beautiful, how amazing, and how awe-inspiring it is. So our Father, our Lord, as soon as you walk in, your kingdom come, your kingdom come is the screen. Every single door that you go into the temple represents the kingdom, and the, and the first thing you see as you walk through that screen is the altar represents the cross. The entire kingdom, the entire purpose, as we read, of reconciliation, all is focused on the cross and the blood of Jesus. The entire kingdom is based on the cross. And the, as we see, the, the, the embroidered is, represents the character of God. So his kingdom, his character, his name, and his cross is the kingdom of God. Your will be done. It's the water label. The next thing is you walk through the temple. The water label was a place that represents where you would come before God and you God, you would see God 
as you, well, I'm sorry. You'd see the, the word of the Lord represents the word of God, where you would see the reflection of God, and you see the reflection of yourself, but also see God in it, and where you're not lining up. The Bible says to wash your soul, wash your life with the word of God, so that you can be aligned with the will of God, and walk in that way and be sanctified. Being sanctified is a matter of being transformed, but also to walk in the will of God. And then, on earth as it is in heaven, when you walk into the tabernacle or into the temple complex, you would have the temple in front of you, which was the place where it was like heaven on earth, where God's presence was, but all around you was the earth. It was the dirt. So as it is in heaven, so may it be on earth. May this tabernacle, this temple, one day grow over the whole earth. May this presence that's in here be the presence everywhere to come one day. So as you walk, then you walk in. This is where it gets very significant. Give us this day our daily bread. That's the show bread. Right? When you walk into the tabernacle, the first thing you see as you walk into the holy, the holy place is the show bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's the cup that's next to the showbread. The cup represents the blood of Christ. The blood speaks of forgiveness, that God has forgiven us, and we are also to forgive others. It's a picture of communion, as too, as soon as you walk in. And lead us not into temptation, leading us. What does the Bible say the word of God is? God's rainbow word is, which is a present word is a light into our feet and a lamp into our path. See how, see, how, see how it parallels? The whole thing parallels. It's fascinating. And deliver us from evil. That's the prayer table, right? In front of the Holy of Holies. Deliver us from evil. It was one of the, I was making a joke about time, you know, before we first started the service. We're not supposed to pray when we're in trouble, right? But how many times do we pray only when you're in trouble? But God recognizes that, right? Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from all kinds of evil. When you look at the different times the prayer altar is used, it's about praying for the saints and prayers of the saints, which is the prayer that they would be relieved, they'd be delivered, they'd be saved, they'd be healed, which is actually all part of the name of who Jesus is. He's a deliverer, he's a healing, he's a savior. They would put in this, this uh, thing into the prayers, into the coals, and he would go up to heaven, and those things also represent Jesus. So Jesus in our prayers to deliver, to heal, and to save. And then comes the last part that we, we add. But there's another part I want to focus on. For thine, now you're not even the Holy of Holies. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Right? Now you're in the presence of God. Now you cast your cares upon the Lord. As you did your spiritual service, as you touched on all the things that he wants us to be sanctified in, now you come to the presence of God himself. And you cast your cares and talk with him. If you were to follow this, let me tell you, I actually follow this now, as God is kind of removing this. Follow this. There is that time, when you come to that point, you are going to meet with God in some way. Sometimes God says, go to my word. Sometimes God says, he gives me a word for that day. Then you leave that temple and act as a continual moving temple there to touch the people's lives around you. Be at least a place of prayer. But this is what it also says. We, we pray that prayer, and I don't think that's in the gospel, but this is the next part of the prayer, which is the end of the prayer. It's not part of the prayer, but it's, if God would talk to you, I think this is the most significant thing that the Father, of God Almighty, and the Holy of Holies, would want you to know. This is what it says. It's one of the most significant things for you in your walk. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's a pretty powerful statement. It's a pretty scary statement. Something that we really have to focus on. It's no, no joke. One of the things he wants us to recognize most, first and foremost, is really understand what the cross has done for your life in all eternity. But because you've been forgiven so much, 
You are called to live a lifestyle continually of forgiveness. Well, so, you know, I always used to pray, God, in this situation, how do I deal with these people? Help me just to draw them closer to you. Whatever the best way of doing that is, to draw them closer to Christ, that's what I'm going to do. I used to always pray that. So when I realized that it's this. It's living a life of forgiveness. It's being forgiving. Repenting myself as much as I need to. And living a lifestyle of repentance. But also living a lifestyle that extends grace and mercy. That's what God's desire. That's what, and it comes back to the cross. This is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God. Right? Do you guys see that parallel there? It's perfect parallel. In every single step. So when you pray the Our Father from now on, remember, you are kind of entering into a spiritual act where you are spiritually becoming, recognize that you are the temple of God. And that you as a priest spiritually are fulfilling those services as you walk through and care for each of those things that God has called you to pray for, which are, he wants you to cover as well, and be covered in. And they recognize that when you do that act and you come to that end, you're talking to God through your grace and mercy is the main thing in our lives which we are going to, to, to exude. And there is a warning to us that if we don't, it won't be rewarded to us that way either. And that's really serious. Okay? Are you guys with me? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us, Lord God, to be truly converted Help us, Heavenly Father, to be fully saved. What that means is, Lord, help us to just really believe. Encourage our faith. Strengthen us. Help us to be empowered and changed. Help us, Lord, to submit our whole lives to you. So that we're able to live this life fully through your spirit that you have called us to live. That you have established in the center of our of our entire walk and spiritual walk with you in prayer. Help us to live that life and not focus on anything else but that. And help us to be overwhelmed with childlike faith and be blessed and full of joy because of the forgiveness you have given to us, because of your great mercy and your great love and your great salvation and your great care and kindness that you have given to us. And help it to exude out of us in a lifestyle of forgiveness and a lifestyle of continual turning to you in all things against our sin nature, but by your Spirit, continually turning to you. And Lord, help us to do it fully in all the way, in every day. In Jesus, your precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's have a few God's clap hands. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is good, right? Amen. Amen. God is good. All right, let's turn to our final hymn, number 267 in your hymnal.